Tonight we continue through the Bible in Ezekiel 31 and 32. And as you know, I've made it my practice to take the morning message out of the portion of Scripture that we've been reading. And I have to confess that uh, this has been uh, a difficult uh, reading to uh, gather something from. I, uh, as a rule, when I'm going through, there's, there's a portion of Scripture that just sort of jumps at me. It just hits. And, and in chapter 33, there are so many powerful texts that I was even tempted to say, well, let's just read through chapter 33 so that I could get the text out of 33 because there's just some exciting things there that the Lord just really ministered to my heart. And I had difficulty finding anything in chapters uh, 31 and 32. In fact, uh, as I was on the way to the pastor's conference this week, uh, I had Gail and my son flying with me. And I, and I said to them, read through these two chapters and see if there's something that speaks to you, you know. Maybe you can help me find some inspiration for my morning message out of, out of these chapters. And so they read through and uh, they didn't come up with anything and I couldn't come up with anything. And so I had more or less planned to just say, well, we'll go through chapters 33 also. Uh, so that I could find uh, some text to speak on. But then, as I was reading again, the 31st chapter, the Lord spoke to my heart concerning pride. You see, God in the 31st chapter is warning the Pharaoh of the destruction that is coming upon the land of Egypt because of pride. The Bible tells us that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And God is using Assyria as an example of a great nation, a powerful nation, that was lifted up with pride and began to boast itself of its power and might and was thus humbled by God. The prophet Ezekiel uses uh, the form of a parable to illustrate this. As Assyria is a great cedar tree in the forest rising above the other trees. And so as we look at the pride of Assyria that brought its destruction, we see there the cause of the pride. The great heights to which this nation had attained. They were conquering other nations but were not conquered themselves. Like the cedar tree that towers above the other trees of the forest, Assyria had arisen or had risen above the other nations. The thick foliage of the cedar tree had formed a shroud that overshadowed the other trees, even as Assyria had overshadowed the other nations. And the birds came and nested in the branches, and the wild beast uh, bore their young under the trees, even as the nations had become vassals of Assyria and were forced to look to Assyria for their maintenance. It spoke of the beauty of the cedar tree. No other tree quite as glorious as the cedar not the fir nor the chestnut. They could not achieve or attain to the beauty or the glory of the cedar. Nothing could be compared with the glory of Assyria. You remember Jonah was sent to the capital city of Assyria, the city of Nineveh. 
And we were told that he was three, dra- three days traversing the city from one end to another. A tremendous city of the ancient world took three days to walk from one end of the city to the other. Glorious in power, glorious in beauty, and thus lifted up with pride because of its greatness. But God said that they didn't realize that he was the one that had made them fair. It was God that planted them by the waters so that their roots could get plenty of nourishment. It was God that had made them great and beautiful, but they began to take credit to themselves. They began to boast in what they had done and in what they had wrought, where God said, I was the one. Taking credit For what God has done is always a dangerous thing. It is a great danger that is repeated over and over again. We've been blessed marvelously by God. We look around and we see the glorious blessing. Yesterday, as I was driving home from the baptismal service, and through my mind were going those hundreds of faces that were just glowing with the love of Jesus as they came up out of the water. And thinking of the work of God, thinking of what God has done in the hearts and lives of so many people, standing there with them in the water, seeing the tears roll down their cheeks, seeing the work of the Spirit being wrought in their hearts as they were being baptized. And I thought, after so many years, still they are by the hundreds And all the way home, I was just rejoicing in the Lord. I was just praising God. In fact, all day yesterday, I was just filled with praises unto God for what He has done, the marvelous work of God's Spirit in our midst. Not the genius of man. Not the abilities or the capacities of man but it's just a glorious, sovereign work of God that we have the privilege of of watching and glorying in it. But you know, oftentimes men who have been used by God, especially gifted by God, begin to look at their accomplishments, the success that God gives them, as though somehow they were responsible for it. And they begin to take glory that really belongs to God. And God said that he will allow no flesh to glory in his sight. And he that exalts himself shall be abased. One of the greatest dangers to the ministry is success. Because people will come around and want to learn your secrets of success. And so often we are prone to point to what God has done as though we ourselves had devised it. We had formulated it. We had figured it out. And we begin to develop success seminars and invite others to come and to learn our secrets of success. Rather than realizing it is a work of God and it is glorious in our eyes. 
And we don't know why God chose to use us. We're as amazed as anybody else. And the interesting thing is that so often, because of what God has done here, men come from all over the world to sit here for a week or two to study the program, to learn what you know, we are doing so that they can go and duplicate it someplace else. And they always leave with an enigma. They say, well, I can preach better than he can preach. And I've got a better education than he has. And, you know, they go on and, and they can't figure out why God has blessed us. Well, that's all right. We can't figure it out either. Except that Paul tells us God has chosen the simple things of this world to confound the wise. I think of the folly of pride. Paul the Apostle said, What do you have but what you have received? And if you have received it, then why do you boast of it as though you didn't receive it? You see, anything of good, anything of value, anything of merit, anything that is worthwhile that I possess has come to me from the goodness and grace of God. And it is a gift from God. It is God who has given to us the strength, the abilities, the understandings. And it is God who has seen fit to bless us. And we must learn to give the glory to God for those things that He has done. To God be the glory, great things He has done. When God called Gideon to deliver the children of Israel from the hand of the Midianites who had invaded the land and who were as grasshoppers covering the land, they were abusing the people of God. They were reigning over them and whenever the children of Israel would harvest their crops, the Midianites would move in and, and take their grain, their crops. And the people were crying unto God because of the oppression of the Midianites. And Gideon was in a cave threshing the wheat from his father's farm. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Gideon, thy mighty man of valor, go in this thy strength, for God has chosen you to deliver the Israelites from the Midians. <laughs> and Gideon said, check the orders, angel. You've got the wrong man. You've got the wrong address. I'm from one of the least tribes and my dad's the least family in the tribe and I'm the least in my father's house. I mean, I'm nothing. <laughs> I'm the most unlikely candidate that you could possibly find for such a task as that. And so Gideon, doubting, put out certain tests and when they were fulfilled, then he agreed and he called the men of Israel to arms. 32,000 of them responded. Now, there were over 135,000 Midianites. Here he is with a motley crew of 32,000. And God looked down at the scene and he saw Gideon's 32,000 men, and he saw the Midianites as they covered the fields like grasshoppers. And God said, Gideon, you've got too many men. 
I'm sure that Gideon thought, Lord, you've got things reversed. They've got too many men. But then God said, I know the hearts of these people. And if I deliver the Midianites into the hands of the 32,000, they will go around boasting what they had done. So go out and tell all of the men who are afraid to fight to go home. Gideon went out and said, Okay, fellows, uh, any of you that are really afraid to go into battle, and who wouldn't be with those odds? He said, You can go on home. 22,000, two-thirds of his army left, leaving him just 10,000 now. God said, Gideon, still too many. I know the hearts of these people. Notice the difficulty that God has doing a work. God wants to work. God wants to deliver the Midianites to Israel. But the difficulty God has in accomplishing his work. Because he knows the heart of the people. And when God works, he knows the tendency of man to try and take credit for the work. Take him down to the brook. Let him get a drink. Everybody puts his face in the water. Send him home. Those that pick the water up and lap it as a dog, they are the ones that I will use to deliver the Midianites to Israel. And of course, you know the story. Of the 10,000, 9,700 put their faces down in the water and were disqualified, sent home. And God said, with the 300 will I deliver the Midianites into the hands of Israel. God had to make it absolutely ludicrous to keep man from glorying and taking credit for what God had done. A case where God was wanting to do a work, but he wanted the glory for the work he did. God desires to do a work, but God also wants the glory for the work he accomplishes. It's interesting that after God delivered the Midianites to Gideon, the men of Israel all came to Gideon. They said, we want you to rule over us. They were ready to give glory to Gideon. The very thing that God was seeking to, to protect against the people wanted to do. Credit Gideon. We want you to rule over us. And Gideon said, I will not rule over you, neither will my sons rule over you, but God shall rule over you, and that's what God wants. Men who will do the work of God and give the credit for God and not take the glory or honor to themselves for what God has wrought. The next time you see a person on the street pushing their belongings in a grocery cart, just say, there go I, but for the grace of God. The next time you see the pictures of the starving children in Somalia, or the horrors and the devastation that is taking place in Bosnia, say, were it not for the grace of God, that could be me. God is good to us. God has blessed us. But he has blessed us as the result of his grace, not because we deserve it or we are meritous in ourselves, but the goodness of God, he has bestowed his abundant honor and blessings upon our lives. And for that, we should rejoice and give glory to him. Assyria had become great. The powerful nation of the ancient world. They had risen above the others, risen to great heights like a cedar tree. And yet they are to be brought down to the ground because they are taking credit. 
They are lifted up with pride and they don't realize it was God who made them fair. What is God's attitude towards pride, the pride of man? First of all, he hates it. Six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. And what is the top of the list of the things that God hates? A proud look. That tops the list of the things that God hates. Jesus said, Whosoever exalts himself shall be abased. Paul and, I mean, James and Peter both tell us that God resists the proud. So that when you are lifted up in pride, you are putting yourself and pitting yourself against God because God resists the proud. Concerning Assyria here in our text, God said because his heart was lifted up, He would deliver Assyria into the hand of the mighty one of the heathen, or Nebuchadnezzar, who would deal with him and drive him out for his wickedness. The great cedar was to be cut down and the branches were to be broken. The Bible tells us that everyone who is proud in his heart is an abomination unto the Lord. So God was wanting the Pharaoh of Egypt to learn the lessons from history. As Paul wrote to us concerning the history of the nation of Israel, he said, these things all happened to them as examples unto us. You see, God uses history to teach us important lessons. That's why the study of history is so valuable if you will learn the lessons from history. What is the Pharaoh to learn from the history of Assyria? That God can bring into the dust, into the pit, the great nations of the past when they take the blessings of God and begin to attribute them unto themselves, and they take glory for what God has done. I'm deeply concerned with our educational system today. But let me say, first of all, that I am so grateful and I am so thankful for every teacher in the public school system who knows Jesus Christ and is using as best they can their position as a teacher to influence their children for good and for righteousness' sake. It's not easy. And I thank God for you. And I pray for you daily as you use that position that God has given to you. Subtly, perhaps, to bring to those children an understanding of the love that comes forth when a person walks with God. But when our children are taught today in school of the greatness of our nation, And to what do we attribute the greatness of our nation? And they are taught that the greatness of our nation is because of our free democratic society. That is what has made our nation great. They are taught that we are great because we have a 
free enterprise system. But the truth of the matter is, even as with Assyria and other nations that have arisen to prominence, it was because God allowed them to do so. And it was God that made America great. God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. It was a provision that allowed men to worship God after the dictates of their own conscience. And those men who were thus worshiping God devised the Constitution and the Bill of Rights as they sought guidance and counsel from God through prayer. And God guided them in the forming of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights by which they sought to guarantee and perpetuate this freedom to worship God after the dictates of a man's own conscience and heart. In one of the great speeches in the history of our nation, there was that recognition that all men were created equal and were endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights. Can you teach that today in the public school? John Peluso sought to teach it down in South Orange County and was dismissed from his class because he taught that man possibly was created, and yet there it is. All men were created equal, but they don't teach that anymore. They don't teach creation. And you can be dismissed from your classroom if you dare to state that men were created by God. They are now being taught that man has evolved. through billions of years of evolutionary process as there is the survival of the fittest and that is the only science allowed to be taught. No wonder we have young people acting like animals when they are taught that they are nothing but an animal. No wonder they are joining in gangs and killing each other when they are taught it's the survival of the fittest. We have reaped, we, are, we have sown the wind and we are reaping the whirlwind. God said to the Pharaoh, that even as the great Assyrian Empire was brought down to hell, so would he. And I might add, and so will we, unless we repent and give glory to God for what he has done. Our nation is on the brink. We are facing a tremendous crisis. The forces of darkness have invaded the land to an unprecedented extent. And unless we as a nation humble ourselves and seek God and cry out to God, even as the great nations and empires of the past have been brought down to the ground, so shall we be brought down to the ground. It is time that we give God his place and recognize the place of God in the greatness of our nation. Shall we pray? Father, help us not to make the same mistake as did Pharaoh 
in not heeding the lessons to be learned from Assyria. The Lord, now that we've advanced through the millenniums and we have so much recorded history from which to learn, we can see, Lord, how true are your words that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And God, we realize that what is true of nations is true of individuals. May we not look at our lives and those things that you have given to us and brought to us And try to attribute our success to our wisdom or our genius. But Lord, may we acknowledge you as the giver of life, of strength, the sustainer of us. And may we give glory to God continually for what God has done. Lord, we give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand? Pride goeth before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Again, the word of the Lord always is to, first of all, repent. That's where it starts. Changing. The change of heart. Lord, I acknowledge you. You are the one who has given the strength. You are the one who has helped us. You are the one, Lord, that has blessed us. May the Lord be with you. May the Lord strengthen you. And may he give you grace and glory through our Lord Jesus Christ.